Hi, I'm Maddie Mikowski, Social Media and Marketing Manager here at Perion Network, and I'm happy to welcome you back to another episode of Ad Tech Talks by Perion. I'm here today with our esteemed guest, Adam Hampt. Adam, thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here, although I don't know if esteemed is a standard I could live up to, but <laughs> we'll see how the podcast goes. Well, I'm glad you can be here today. Adam has been a strategy and branding consultant to Perion and its business units for close to five years. He has a deep background in all aspects of consumer and digital marketing, which includes advising CMOs, CEOs, and founders of both unicorn startups and global brands. Those include PepsiCo, Match.com, Citibank, McKinsey, WeWork, the disruptive Internet of Things partner, Williot, and dozens of others. Adam was a digital advisor to the legendary Obama presidential campaign in 2008, sits on the boards of Scott's miracle Grow and 1-800-Flowers, is co-host of the Jolty podcast and co-author of the best-selling Dictionary of the Future. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> it's very it well. impressive. So today we're going to discuss some inherent tensions that exist in digital marketing and advertising today. But before we dive in, Adam, I would love for you to just introduce yourself a little bit more. I know I gave a big picture, but I just want to know kind of like your experience in ad tech and what landed you here. So what landed me in the world of ad tech is basically a long career as a creative person and as a strategist in advertising and marketing in general. So if you're going to be in those disciplines and you're going to be actively engaged today, you really need to be a participant of and a deep contributed to what's happening in the ad tech space because it is the most dynamic scene that we've really ever seen in the, in the history of advertising. For a long time, up until the internet revolution, the old adage of, I know half my advertising is wasted, but I don't know which half, um, is something that people had to live with. There was really no disciplined, metrics-driven approach to really tracking accountability in advertising. That's all changed now, and it's it's really an exciting time. Some of the basic principles, though, of how do you communicate, how do you tell stories, have remained unchanged. So you, the way to think about it, I think, is continuity in terms of how the human brain operates, how we persuade people, how we motivate people, and then updated with new ways to reach people, new ways to measure. So it's it's an exciting time because it takes the universal and puts it in a particularly dynamic context today. So because of your vast experience, Adam, we thought it would be great to have you on the podcast, but I do want to remind you that I'm still new to the space and not yet fluent in all the lingo. So pardon my interruptions. Um, I might have some questions as you go, just to make sure I'm following. I'll make sure that I don't get too wonky or geeky or nerdy. Love it. Thank you. In, in any order. Uh, but hey, what better way to learn about the space, okay. you know, from the expert himself? So we're going to start with a discussion around why these tensions exist at all and how complex and multidimensional the culture is, why a single minded view will lead marketers astray. Let's start with tension number one, branding versus performance. So do you want to kind of just explain what you mean by this? Sure. But before I do that, let me just elaborate on what you said, which is why are there these tensions and these stresses in marketing? Because human beings are complicated. We're basically not rational creatures. We like to think we are, but we're influenced by a combination of what's happening out in the world and what's happening inside our brains. And unless marketers really understand those tensions, then it's going to be hard to communicate and succeed. Why does somebody put a little sweet and low in their coffee and then have a giant piece of cheesecake at the same time? Because we want to believe different things at the same time. That's why as much as the data is important, there's the human component that we can't ignore. So in terms of your specific question about branding and performance, just to go back a little bit and talk about why that is a tension. So traditionally speaking, branding means I'm going to invest my advertising dollars to create a perception around this company that makes the brand as appealing and as uh, illustrious and as part of the culture as possible. So think about Super Bowl advertising. For the most part, it's 100% branding. Nobody's trying to sell something at that moment. Although last year in the Super Bowl, you remember, may remember the floating QR yes. code, yeah. and it got all that attention because somebody was trying to close the gap between branding and promotion in a single unit. So traditionally, you've got branding over here, which is a, in a way back to the adage of, I don't know which half of my advertising is wasted. Although there are ways to track branding, which I can talk about in a minute. 
And then performance, mean, which means I spend a dollar and I get back $2, or I get back $3, the ROAS, return on advertising spend. And traditionally, those have been divided. And there's always debates within um, the, the marketing community about where, at, where dollars should be invested. What's happening today, interestingly enough, is that that gap is being closed. The tension still exists, but it's being narrowed. So if you look at what's happening, let's say on TikTok, which is now going to have live shopping and other channels, you have new brands being introduced by influencers. So that is, quote, branding. And at the same time, there's an immediate transactional opportunity. That's performance. So the traditional gap, because of the way the platforms have emerged, is narrowing. But still, there's a debate. And now, in these economic times, we hear a lot about, where should I be spending my money? And there's a lot of evidence there's a famous Harvard Business Review article from back in the two, around the 2008 meltdown, which looked longitudinally over time and actually found that companies that brands that continue to invest in the story of their brand actually did better. And that companies that pulled back on brand advertising and brand marketing actually suffered. And the reason is that when you are building a perception of a brand, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but the more you could reinforce it and extend it, the stronger it is. There's a famous story in marketing. They Somebody said, it may be apocryphal, but let's take it as fact. <laughs> somebody said to the CEO of Coca-Cola, you know, what would happen if all your factories burned down tomorrow? He said, if my factories burned down tomorrow, I'd rebuild them. But if somebody woke up in the morning or everybody woke up in the morning and didn't know what Coca-Cola stood for, I'd be out of business. So that's really, in a nutshell, what branding is. Um, so I think what we're going to see in the future, which is, I think, one of the exciting um, paths forward, is that there's going to be a closer correlation between branding and promotion. And we'll also see new techniques to measure how much a brand really sticks in somebody's mind. While you do sit on advisory boards for companies, right now we're obviously in a recession-like time. What advice would you give, definitely? put the dollars towards branding. Is I that think, what you're getting I at? I, I, I would say if you are a direct to consumer brand and your whole model is ROAS and the economic, the unit economics of advertising, then you've got to tweak your performance, tweak your performance all the time. Okay. But if you're a brand that's omnichannel where you sell direct, but you also sell through retail, then you must not pull back on, 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 on the, on the brand storytelling. Okay, shall we move on to tension number we two? We shall move on. All right. So let's talk about short form versus long form content. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Sure. And again, this is one of those conversations like branding and promotion that goes back many, many years. So how much copy should I show the consumer used to be the question, even before before there was, uh, even before there was TV. So David Ogilvy, who you may have heard of, a very famous uh, guy who started Ogilvy and Mather, who wrote a book you should read uh, confessions of a ad man or something like that okay. but he had a he had a mantra um the more you tell the more you sell and for a long time that was the way agencies um presented brands to the public there was really no brand direct very little in those days and those were if you go back and look in the 50s and 60s even to the 70s Long copy ads were very, very common. So let's hop in next to tension number three. We're going to talk about startup brands versus legacy. There was a period pre-pandemic when the conventional wisdom was that disruptive startup brands were going to just drive all the legacy brands either out of business or really force them to consolidate. So whether it was Casper in the mattress category or all birds in the footwear category, we all know what the disruptor startup brands were. And the big, in the case of food, the big um, food and beverage companies all panicked. And pretty much every legacy brand said to themselves, we have to change because the nature of what the consumer wants is changing. Consumers don't want brands from big industrial commercial companies. They want small artisanal craft brands. And as a result of that, the world has changed forever. And a lot of the big brands were spooked. And they had reason to be because a lot of them were lacking transparency. They hadn't caught up with sustainability. They didn't understand how to use digital channels, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. 
So that was like a heart attack for these, for, for whether it was P&G or Unilever or Clorox or doesn't matter, Church and Dwight, or in financial services, two big brands. So they all scurried around and they basically did two or three things. One was they have a lot of money in deep pockets, so they acquired some of these startup brands because they knew that it would take too long to build them in-house. Plus, they were too big and bureaucratic and didn't really have the ability. So Coke bought vitamin water, or many, many examples like that. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing they tried to do was just get kind of cooler and hipper in the way they communicated themselves. And it turned out that legacy brands weren't doomed. In fact, I was just looking the other day at Morning Consult, which is a research company put out. You should take a look. It's really interesting. And it had the favorite brands of Gen Z. And a shocking number of them were big brands, including Kentucky Fried Chicken, including Skittles, including all the brands that five years ago you would have thought would be headed for the right. landfill. Interesting, wow. And then there's another similar list for millennials, and it's a mixture. There are young startup, cool brands, hipster brands, but there are also traditional brands. And that's a really good example of the tension. If those brands remain cool and fun, and do the and use the kind of social media tactics that this generation wants they can maintain relevance so i think it's again it's an and legacy brands have a place but they can't become too complacent and startup brands have a place but they also can't think that just because they're young and cool that they're automatically going to win the hearts and minds of the audience so what do you i'll just say so what are you finding in your own personal consumption are you do you mix traditional brands and new brands yeah i feel like i I was actually thinking about that while you were talking because I do fall under that like zillennial yeah. category. Um, and I do find myself extremely loyal to certain brands, but also extremely disturbed by other brands that I like don't want to Disturbed deal because, with. because of their values? Yeah, like Chick-fil-A is like a quick That good was one. on the list, by the way, of the mo of favorite brands. Of of, of uh, Gen Z. I, I don't remember if it was Gen Z or millennials, but it was on the list. Which... People find themselves conflicted with Chick-fil-A. I yeah. feel like, um, cause it's really good. I, I'm also trying to think of other things. Also like Diet Coke. I'm like diehard Diet Coke fan. Um, but there are other brands that I admire that are on the newer side and I find them all through targeted Instagram advertising. So. Right, and TikTok too. Tick TikTok is a big one, especially now uh, when it comes to even search. I know this is a huge thing. I search everything on TikTok, like anything I need to know how to do or a product I should buy is always through TikTok. And how valuable you find their algorithm? How useful, I should say. Um, I find it extremely useful. I think I'm able to find things that actually make sense. I guess it's like the human version of chat GPT. Right. I guess that's what I'd compare it to um, because I'm looking for a certain way to do something in like the best way, the most efficient way. And someone's able to tell me like with their voice on the screen with a visual representation. So you yeah. use it for life hacks a lot. Yeah. And productivity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And do you find that the brands that you discover, let's say personal care, cosmetics, beauty products, that you're as loyal to those brands as you might be to brands that have been around for a long time, more legacy brands? Yeah, I would say, um, a specific example I can give you. I used to love like Mac products and um, I just grew up with it. My mom used it. She, this is what she showed me. But Elf Cosmetics, I'm not yeah, sure um, how new they are, but on social media, they're just killing it. And they have like a dupe for everything, right. all the expensive products. And they're just super consumer friendly. And I love their products. And then how loyal will you be to Elf if somebody comes along that's a better Elf? We'll see. We'll see when that time comes. But I do really like admire what Elf is doing and making things like accessible to everyone. And accessible price wise. Price wise, right? And I mean, it is everywhere. You can find it at the drugstore, Ulta, which is accessible to yeah. everyone. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Let's move into tension number four. This is privacy versus carefree and share free. Right. This is a really interesting subject. So. You know, here at Perion, um, we've got Sort. We innovated a, a not totally anonymous, privacy-free, cookie-free solution. I sound like a commercial. <laughs> that performs better than uh, cookies, outperforms cookies without invading your privacy. And there's a reason we did that. We did that because there's a real macro trend that we're seeing, and this is across all demographics, about privacy. 
And what we used to accept as the norm is now becoming unacceptable. We're all sick of being stalked and having those retargeting ads follow us all around uh, the internet or mobile, wherever we go. And if you look at the data, vast majority of people say, brands have gone too far in invading my privacy. And I'm sure you're following what's happening in, in Washington in terms of privacy legislation. Right. So you could say there's a, mac there's a huge macro trend towards privacy. We did a great video that shows how hard it is to live a privacy-free life. But on the other hand, behaviors don't always follow intention. And there is a lot of people that are defined as privacy pragmatists who are willing to accept a certain amount of intrusion if they get benefits. And you know, you talked about TikTok and products you discover on TikTok. If your behavior on TikTok, forget the China part of it, but if your behavior on TikTok makes the algorithm better and smarter and able to then recommend products that you will like in other categories that are elf-like products in whatever other categories you care about, then maybe, you know, the fact that they're tracking every click and one day tracking your eye movement, maybe that won't bother you so much. So that is a real tension, how much we value our privacy versus how much we will surrender some of our privacy in exchange for a reciprocal benefit which is being introduced to products I care about and ideas I care about, information that I, that I value. And that's going to be a debate that goes on forever and ever and ever because we're going to find new ways that marketers have to track our behavior. I mean, we'll see what happens with um, some of the biometric technologies that are being developed now. We could look at eye movement. Um, and our desire to maintain our, our independence. Um, so it's gonna be a tension that would be interesting to see evolve. And I think from a, br from a brand point of view, because we're here to talk about brands and technology, I think understanding your consumer is key here. What do people, what does your consumer really care about? And segmenting your consumer, not everybody cares in the same way about the same things. Is there a brand you can specifically reference that you think does this well, like understanding their consumer and handling the privacy carefree versus share free? I think in terms of understanding the consumer, I will say that political campaigns and they're really brands probably do better than most brands. Oh, wow. I think the data that political campaigns generate um, is really deep and a lot of it is because a lot of because the data is in, a lot of it's in the public record because voter rolls are available. So right. that's not an invasion of privacy. If I find out where you live and who you voted for the last three times, you're probably too young to have voted three times, but <laughs> last time um, that tells me a lot about you. Then I can overlay that with other data that's available, third party data, and I can have a I can have a pretty good picture of you. So I think, you know, it used to be for a long time brands were ahead of politicians in terms of their targeting ability. But I think it's flipped a little bit. And I think, you know, and there's always a debate who knows better, who has, who has better insight, Republicans or Democratic candidates. But I think I think that um, brands can learn a lot from politicians. Wow, I never knew that. They're brands. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, politicians have an end date. It's called election day. And you got to change people's minds by that date. And it's a real forcing factor and a real discipline. Most brands don't have that. No brand really has that, unless right. it's a Washington's Day mattress sale. It just kind of rolls on forever. It does the, the discipline about marketing to a specific endpoint doesn't really exist with brands as much as it does in, po in politics. You have no choice. Okay, Adam. And for our final tension of the day, tension number five. We're were, talking you, were you tense during this? This is your first one. This might, Did the yeah. tensions make you tense? The tensions question. made me tense, okay. but you know, talking them out really good, good, good. Warm me up, calm me down. Yes. Okay, good. Um, but tension number five: wellness versus wildness. Right. Can you explain that a little bit for us? The wellness economy um, is about three trillion dollars. It's massive, and it touches every aspect of the consumer economy. It touches travel. It touches the products we consume, food and beverage. It touches technology apps like Calm and Headspace. It touches pretty much everything. And it's also cross-generational too. Everybody's stressed out today. What is the number with more than a third of Americans, particularly now post-pandemic, 
live with anxiety, live with stress, you know, so it's everywhere. We try to behave, we try to be grounded, we try to anchor ourselves, but at the same time, we, we take risks. Now, some people have more dopamine in the brain, so they, they or produce more dopamine, so they're more risk takers than others, but there are extreme vacations, there's increased consumption of marijuana, you, you've, there's just a lot of just a lot of press recently about ketamines mm -hmm. and psychedelics. So it's that tension again between wanting to do what I know is good for me and wanting to step out and explore and try and push the envelope and um, take risks, even if there are risks um, that I know I shouldn't be taking. And those risks manifest themselves in different ways. So from a brand point of view, it's really interesting because there are some brands that naturally lend themselves to Lululemon that lend themselves to wellness and well-being because that's what yoga is about. But then there are other forms of yoga that are more aggressive and push you more. So I think in every, pretty much even in that category, even in yoga, there are opportunities to appeal to our desire for wildness, for more extreme behavior, and then the desire for more grounded and um, therapeutic behavior. And again, depending on where we are at a particular, where a consumer is at a particular moment in their lives, or even a particular moment in their day, yeah. because day part matters, right? Or where you you have you as a brand have the ability, I think, to establish an emotional connection, a resonant emotional connection, by recognizing that again we're complex human beings, and sometimes we we don't give a shit, and sometimes we give a shit. I think bottom line, marketers need to connect the dots between these data points, and if you're just too narrow looking at one data point, you're not gonna appreciate the richness and complexity of human behavior. Right, so I was gonna ask, do you think the marketers who are out there killing it are having a moment for both, both the well and the wild? I yeah. do. And then also you can say, how do you make the well wild and how do you make the wild a little bit more well? Yeah. So kind of come to the, the golden place in the middle. But yes, I think marketers will succeed when they look, as I said, at the complexity of behavior across a lot of different categories. And also don't just look at your category. So, and that's another mistake marketers make. So if you're if you're Mac, you might be looking just at consumer behavior in the makeup space. But mm -hmm. what about travel? What about what people are doing in the rest of their lives? Marketers tend to be too narrow and over-focused because that's what they think about their brands, but they right. don't think on their category, but they don't think more broadly enough about what the consumer is doing when they're outside their category. And that's a piece of advice I give. Adam, it's been so great chatting with you today about these industry tensions, which are all extremely hot topics right now. I personally feel like I've gained so much from this and I'm genuinely excited for our listeners to hear this. So thank you so much for joining us today um, and having this conversation with me on Ad Tech Talks by Perion. And to our listeners, we will see you next time. And thank you for being such a great host and I was proud to be here for your inaugural podcast. Oh, thank you, Adam. Thank you.